morning, everybody. Good to see you this morning, this uh, snowy November morning. I didn't know it was snowing out there until a couple minutes ago. <clears throat> this is the topics class, and we're doing a series we started last week, Detective Work with the Word of God. And we're not going to give the lesson that we announced last week. We've changed it because, for a good reason, we changed it because uh, we uh, been made aware of some other things that go along with last week's lesson. If you were here last week and, and remember, uh, we saw last week a da uh, the date of destiny, the day the Lord hath made, where seven things happened in regard to the nation Israel down through the centuries. It all happened on the same calendar date. Well, this morning we're going to be looking at eight things that happened concerning Israel that were all bad things. And they all happened on the same date, spanning 35 different centuries. So this is, a, 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 we, weren't, we weren't planning on giving this last week, but uh, we've come up with it since then. So let's begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father, we come in Jesus' name and we pray now that you would bless the study of the word of God, teach us and admonish us and and uh, edify us, Lord, by the Spirit of God through, the, through your word. And may we catch a fresh glimpse of Almighty God this day and your blessed Son, the Lord Jesus. We ask these things in your precious name. Amen. Okay, so if you'll take your Bibles, please, and have them open at 1 Corinthians chapter 16. We're going to catch a verse there shortly. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. <coughs> Well, last time we saw a special day of blessing for the Jews, and that was on the, in the Jewish month of Nisan on the 17th day. Eight spectacular things happened on that day. It was a day of blessing. This is the day which the Lord hath made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Today we're going to look at a dark day of destiny for the Jews, and notice in your note sheets there on the first page, Obadiah, the prophet Obadiah, the 13th verse of his prophecy, thou shouldst not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. And then he goes on and says, yea, thou shouldst not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity. And then the third time, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. He, Obadiah, three times in that verse, speaks of a day of calamity in regards to Israel. So last week we saw seven dates with destiny, and those were all good things. Today we're going to see eight dates with destiny, and they are eight days of calamity, the day of Israel's calamity. Now, last week we gave you a um, chart that has the calendar on it, the Hebrew calendar, as opposed to the calendar that we're using today. And we included that same chart in today's lesson. And if you, it's uh, on the second page there. And if you notice, the month of Nisan is the first year on the Jewish religious calendar. And that's the, that's the one they're going by now, the month of Nisan. And we saw Nisan 17 was the uh, day the Lord made uh, that was a, such a day of blessing. Now, today we are dropping down to the fifth month, which is the month Ab, or it is sometimes called Av. It's either A-B or A-V. They, they, they don't seem to make, have made up their mind how they're going to spell it. But it's the month Av, and that corresponds to our July and August. And uh, so we have that, that's the day uh, on the, in the month of Av, on the ninth day of the month on the Hebrew calendar is the uh, day of, the, the dark day of destiny here. Uh, it happens in, for most of the time in August and it will be um, Av 9. Now, we entitled it, A Day That Will Live in Infamy. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, back on December the 8th, 1941, told the nation about the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor. Harbor. He said that that will be, December 7th will be a date, that, a day that will live in infamy. Well, if that was a day that lives in infamy, what about Av 9? 
because here is a date of nine calamities that happened all on the same date, all regarding Israel. Notice Deuteronomy 32, verse 35. To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand. In the Gospels, Jesus preached the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But here we read God is saying the day of their calamity is at hand. And the, the day of their calamity was at hand. The, ver, the first time uh, that this date is of particular significance was just a, a couple of years away, removed from when God said this in the book of Deuteronomy. So let's do some detecting. Detecting day one. This is the first link in an eight link chain that runs through history covering 30 five centuries. Think of it, 35 centuries. And on this one particular date, the month Av, on the ninth of that month, how one thing after another, one calamity after another, happened concerning Israel. Now the first one we're going to see is back in the book of Numbers, and this is where the 12 spies come back with their report on the land. Remember, they sent the 12 spies in to spy out the land, and they come back with their report. And in Numbers chapter 13 and verse 27, the scripture tells us, And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sent us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. You remember the story. They cut this huge bunch of grapes and it took two men to carry it on a pole. They come back and then and they said it's it's a land of milk and honey. It's a land of fruit. Look at this big bunch of grapes. This is a wonderful place. But the first word in the next verse is nevertheless. And that's like the word but, you know. Well, uh, yeah, such and such a thing is pretty good, but well, this is the same thing. Nevertheless, verse 28 tells us, the people, uh, uh, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled, and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. And th those children of Anak are, were giants, a, a race of giant people. Then in verse 31, they continue on. It says, the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And in verse 32, it says that they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. They are huge, uh, huge people. Then in verse 33, the next verse, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak. Remember they, they saw in verse 28, they said they saw the children of Anak. And here we see the sons of Anak, this, this race of giant people, which come out of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. And so what is the conclusion? It's a great land. It's a wonderful land. But the people there are too powerful and we can't enter into it. So when we get to Numbers chapter 14, verses 3 and 4 tell us, And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, and that our wives and our children should be prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return unto, into Egypt. A dark day of destiny for the, um, the children of Israel. Rather than believe God, they believed the report of the spies. Now, if you have your Bibles open to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, we just want one verse to look at, and that's verse 9. Scripture says, For a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. There's a great door, Paul said, that is open to me, but there's a lot of enemies out there, many adversaries. And if you are involved at all in the work of God, 
you know by now that any time that there is an open door to serve God, there is going to be opposition. It might come from outside the church, it might come from inside the church, but it comes with the territory. There's an open door and great adversaries. Well, God opened the door for Israel and there were many adversaries there. And this, the, the report of the spies caused them to lose heart and they were going to turn back. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us what day this is, but it is recorded in the Jerusalem Talmud. It's a historical reference, not scripture, but it's a historical account of the history of Israel. And we read in the Jerusalem Talmud that it was on the ninth day of Ab or Av, whatever way you want to call it, in the year 1490 BC. And so this is the first day, the first calamity, the day of calamity. Uh, this is the first time that it happens. And then we're going to see it over the next 35 centuries, how that time after time after time, a calamity befalls the people of Israel. And um, it's always on that day, not always, but many times on that day. So right here in the book of Numbers, the die is cast and unbelief takes over and unbelief paralyzes people. Believers are paralyzed by their unbelief. They, the great exploits for God are never done because of unbelief. And this is a prime example. Now, ever since in Jewish history, this day, the month of Av, on the ninth of the month has been a day of fasting and mourning for the Jews. Not just because of the report of the spies, but because of all that which has happened since then. Well, let's move through time now to the year 589 BC. That's 900 years later. And Solomon has built a beautiful temple. And uh, it's there at Jerusalem, the house of God. And as Israel goes into apostasy, God tells Israel that they're going to be taken captive into Babylon if they don't repent. They do not repent. They continue to worship other gods. In fact, did you know that when Israel was worshiping all these idols, God sent them as captives into the nation of Babylon because Babylon was the fountainhead of idolatry. They got their belly full of idolatry in Babylon. And to this day, the Jews, after they left Babylon, never again ever turned to idols. They, they forsook the Lord, but they never again returned to idols. Well, they are taken in 589 B.C., they are taken into Babylon. Now, the scripture tells us, if you'll notice there on your uh, the next page there, in Jeremiah chapter 52, verse 12, it says, now in the fifth month. Now, if you check out your chart, you find that the fifth month is the month Av, or Ab. And it says, in the tenth day of the month. Well, that's one day after the day of calamity, because uh, the day of calamity is the ninth. It says, in the tenth day of the month, which was the 19th year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came uh, Nebzar Aden, captain of the guard, which served the king of Babylon into Jerusalem. And we read here that he does four things. He burned the house of the Lord, and secondly, the king's house, burns the king's house, and thirdly, he burns all the houses of Jerusalem, and fourthly, all the houses of the great men burned he with fire. So the, the date that is given here is in the fifth month and the tenth day of the month. Now, if you look down into 2 Kings, verse 25 there, verses 8 and 9, we, uh, uh, this could look like a, like a contradiction in the Bible, but it's not, because you let the Bible explain the Bible and you find there's no contradictions. We read there in 2 Kings, and in the fifth month, that's our month of Av, on the seventh day of the month. Now, Jeremiah said on the tenth day, and in 2 Kings it says in the uh, seventh day, which is the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came Nebuzar Aden, captain of the guard, servant of the king of Babylon, into, unto Jerusalem. And then we read the four things that he did. He burnt the house of the Lord. Secondly, he burnt the king's house. Thirdly, he burnt the houses of Jerusalem. And fourthly, every great man's house burnt he with fire. 
So Jeremiah says it was on the 10th of the month, and in 2 Kings, it said, they tell us it is on the seventh day of the month. Well, how do we know which is right? Well, the truth of the matter is they're both right. In the Jerusalem Talmud, <clears throat> the historical account that is written, it's outside of scripture, but the historical account that was, uh, was written there, we are told that the fire in which they burned the house of God, it was set in the evening of the ninth, burned all that night, and on into the tenth of the month. Now, what happened was this, Babylon fought, the Babylonian army fought their way into the courtyard of the temple on Av 7 of the year 589. The Jews retreating, they, they went into the uh, courtyard of the temple. Then they, uh, as, as they could see, the Babylonians were knocking down the walls. They were coming in. They retreated into the house of God, this beautiful, ornate temple that Solomon had built a number of years before. And they come into the, into the house of God. Some of them got up on the roof. They're shooting arrows down there at the Babylonian soldiers. The Babylonians are, uh, uh, they know they're going to have to get into the temple in order to uh, defeat the, the uh, armies of Israel. So what did they do? They camped in the courtyard from the 7th until the 9th of the month of Av. And then on the 9th, they set the temple on fire with all of the Jewish army inside. They set it on fire and it burned all that night of the ninth and all the next day, which was the tenth. And by the tenth, the city was gone. It had been, it had been destroyed. And so uh, <clears throat> Jeremiah wrote about this in the book of Lamentations. And he tells us in the book of uh, Lamentations. He says, The Lord hath cast off his altar, he hath abhorred his sanctuary, he hath given up into the hand of the enemies the walls of the palaces. This is talking about the temple there. He says that he's given them the walls. They had beaten down the wall, the courtyard of the temple. They came in, they camped right around the temple there, and they stayed there for two days, and then they sent the temple on fire. And, Jer and Lamentations goes on and says, They have made a noise in the house of the Lord as in the day of a solemn feast. And so here we see the temple is destroyed, a monumental event in the life of the Jews. That meant that their temple worship was, was gone. It was destroyed. They couldn't, they had no priesthood anymore. They had no altar. They had no, uh, they had no, um, sacrifice they had nothing anymore and they're taken and carried off into babylon and that's where they spent the next 70 years and so the uh, the month of av on the ninth day of the month is the second day of calamity that is recorded for us then the third day takes us into the future 500 i'm sorry 659 years up to the time just past the time of jesus and this is where Herod's temple is destroyed in the year 70 AD. This is a, one of the most fantastic uh, facts of history. The Babylonians destroyed the temple on the ninth day of the month of Av in the year 589 BC. 659 years later, the Romans destroyed the temple on the ninth day of the month of Av in the year 70 AD. And it, uh, it both happens on the same day. Now, Herod, uh, I'm sorry, Ezra, after the Babylonians destroyed the temple, Ezra, after the captivity is over, he goes back, he rebuilds the temple. But along came Herod, and Herod put probably in dollars, millions of dollars, into the temple. He made it all ornate and beautiful. He had polished cedar wood uh, throughout the temple. He had gold all over. The roof was gold. There was gold every place. There was gold on the, the leaves of gold on the doors. It was, it was a beautiful ornate structure. And so once again, the um, Jews hole up in the temple as the Romans are coming after them. And the very same thing, uh, very same thing happens. Now, 
when this happened in the year 70 AD, the entire New Testament had already been written, all except the five books that John wrote, via the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. That was the only part of the New Testament that hadn't been written yet. At this time, John was either in Ephesus, which he was for part of the time, or banished as a prisoner on the Isle of Patmos. And so there is no scripture written that talks about this after it happened. But we have the word of the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus, <coughs> who was a contemporary of Jesus, and he recorded the historical account of this. And here's what he said, the boxed in area there on your note sheet. He said, however, one cannot but wonder at the accuracy of this period thereunto, relating for the same month and day, which were now observed, as I said before, wherein the holy house was burnt formally by the Babylonians. The Romans did it on exactly the same day that the Babylonians did. But there's some other things connected with this. At the Passover, and you remember the Passover is in the month Nisan. Remember last week we talked about that? It's in the first month. At the Passover, the population of Jerusalem increased tremendously because of the Passover. There was five times the population at feast days in Jerusalem as in a, in a normal day. Historians believe that there was something about a hundred and a quarter, I, I'm sorry, one and a quarter million Jews in the city at the Passover. Well, the Roman army picked the Passover to begin their assault. And they surrounded the city and they sealed it off and they told the Jews to surrender. They refused to do it. And so, they just conducted a siege on the city, and that siege lasted for five months. And it brings us up into the month of Av, the fifth month. And so it goes from, the, from Passover, which was the first month, unto the month of Av, the fifth month. And in the fifth month, the Romans broke through, they attacked the temple, and they set it on fire, and they destroyed the temple, and the date is a historical date that we're all familiar with, 70 AD. However, in 33 AD, the Lord Jesus prophesied that this very thing would happen. Going to the next page, we have Luke chapter 19. Here's the words of Jesus. And when he was come near, he beheld the city, and he wept over it. This is Jerusalem. Saying, If thou hadst known, even thou at least in this thy day, this is the day of calamity he's talking about. In this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee that thy enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side. That's exactly what the Romans did 37 years later after Jesus said it would happen. It goes on and says, And shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another. That was Jesus' prophecy of what was going to happen in 70 AD. Now he talks about it again in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21. He says, When ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. And that began at Passover of the year 70 AD and lasted until the ninth of the month Av in that same year. Now, the, um, as we said, the temple was covered with gold. There was gold all over that temple. It's up there on the roof, it's at different places. And when the Romans set it on fire, gold is a soft metal and it melted and it began to run down and infiltrated all of the, the big huge stone blocks that the temple was made out of and so forth. And so after the fire was out, the Roman soldiers, seeing their opportunity, they went and got bars to pry with and so forth, and they began to pry the stones off on the temple to get at that gold that had melted, run down there and, and uh, melted. And uh, they fulfilled the prophecy that Jesus said. He had said there in Luke 19, that they shall not leave one stone upon another concerning the temple. And 
that came literally to pass. Thanks to the Romans and their greed for gold, they left the temple with not one stone upon another. They had to get at that melted gold. And so <clears throat> this event is prophesied also in the book of Daniel. And the book of Daniel was written 600 years before it happened. But here's what it says in Daniel. And this is, a, I think this is an amazing thing. Daniel 9.26. It says, after three score and two weeks <clears throat> shall Messiah be cut off. And that's, of course, as a prophecy of the cross. Jesus is going, to, Jesus, the Messiah, is going to be cut off. But not for himself, because he's being cut off, being crucified for our sins. Then it says, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the sanctuary is, of course, the temple. The, pe the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's one of the passages that w make, that through which we know that it's going to be a revived Roman Empire that, uh, through which Antichrist shall come. Now, this prince that shall come in Daniel 9.26 is a reference to the Antichrist, but it has a twofold application. It's what we call the law of double reference. It is also talking about the Roman general Titus, who in 70 AD led the march, led them to, uh, and ultimately the temple was destroyed. Now, Titus was not a prince. He was, the, uh, at least he wasn't a prince when the war began. His father, Vespasian, was a Roman general. So you, so you got father and son, they're both generals. Well, Vespasian, he's off someplace else, but Titus has been commissioned to come in and rout out the Jews. And so that, that's exactly what he does. Well, he did that in 70 AD. However, one year before, 69 AD, Vespasian, his father, becomes the emperor of the Roman Empire. And because his father is now the emperor, that makes Titus a prince. And so he wasn't a prince when the battle began, but now he be automatically becomes a prince because his father has uh, become the emperor of the mighty Roman Empire. And so uh, we, we have all of these interesting, fabulous things connected with this day of calamity. Then number four, and this happened a year later, the Romans plow Jerusalem and the site of the Temple Mount and they plow it with salt. This is in 71 AD, a year later. And they did this so that no vegetation would grow there. They drove the Jews out of Israel and they didn't want them coming back in. So they figure if we destroy the land so they can't grow anything, they won't come back in. And so they plowed it with salt. Guess which, what day they did it. It was on the month of Av, on the ninth day of the month. That was exactly the day that they pronounced this destruction and calamity upon the city of Jerusalem. Now, this is prophesied also in the Old Testament in the book of Micah. Micah, going to the next page now. Micah chapter 3 and verse 12. It says, Therefore shall Zion, and that's a name in the Bible for Jerusalem, Zion. Therefore shall Zion for your sake be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps. And that's exactly what happened. It was fulfilled in the year 71 AD by the advancing Roman army. And so that's four things that took place, four calamities that took place on the very same day. Now we're going to leave the first century and the, the other centuries that involve Scripture. We're going to go into the second century. And in the second century, we have a false messiah by the name of Bar Kachba, who raised an army and tried to defeat the Romans. He was beaten and defeated on the very same day of the month of Av, the ninth day of the month. 
Now Jesus said there, after him there would be false messiahs that would, that would arise. Uh, when we were over in Israel in 1995, we got to see one of them. Uh, he's, uh, I was told our Wednesday night class this last week. Uh, he's standing on a street corner in Jerusalem, and he's dressed in this pale blue robe. And it's got all this ornate gold trim around it, and he's got a gold crown on his head, and he's standing there with a little harp, and he's singing. And he claims to be the Jewish Messiah. And if you're interested in, um, in uh, having some uh, audio tapes of the Jewish Messiah, he was selling them. <laughs> and, he, <laughs> and he's terrible. His voice is awful. But he was selling these, selling these tapes. Well, he's another false Messiah. But this one was Bar Kochba. Oh, by the way, there was another Jewish Messiah, false Messiah, that lived in New York City that died about, I guess about five, six, seven years ago. Uh, he was always, they always said he was going to be going back to Israel and setting them free and, and so forth, but he never made it. He died also. There have been many down through history. Well, here was one, Bar Kochba, and uh, Jesus said there shall arise, in Matthew 24, he says, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets. And then in John 5, 43, he said, I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. But if another come in his own name, him ye will receive. Speaking of false prophets or false messiahs. And so here was this one, uh, the word bar in, in, uh, biblic in biblical language, whether it be in Hebrew or Greek. The word bar means son of. And um, this means uh, son of Kachba, this, that was this false messiah's name, the son of Kachba. And he raised himself up, claimed to be the messiah, formed an army of Jews, went against the Romans, and he was thoroughly crushed and defeated. And as far as I know, this is the last time in history in which the Jews rebelled against their oppressors until... Warsaw, Poland, in the 1940s. Most of the Jewish history, they just, uh, the Gentile nations dished it out and they took it. And it went on and on in, in, uh, in that way. Now this Jewish army was slaughtered on Av 9, the year 135 AD. Another day of calamity. Well, let's move ahead many years now to England. This is number six. England expelled all the Jews in the year 1290 AD on the ninth day of the month of Av. The king was Edward I, and he ordered all Jews out of England. And for the next four centuries, England was what they call Jew-free. There were no Jews in England. And you know what? the history of England was during those, those next 400 years. England, as you know, is an island. And it's an island there in the Atlantic Ocean, and it's, it's not too far off the coast of France, you know, and um, the channel is in between there. And it's just an island nation. And for the next 400 years, England was nothing more than an island nation. And then in the year 1657, 367 years later, Oliver Cromwell, was a, who was a Christian, he granted the Jews both entrance into England and citizenship with full rights, in uh, the legal rights as citizens. And when he did this, England began to sp prosper. Now he did that in the year 1657. By the 1800s, England had spread their empire to where they ruled 25% of the earth's surface. The saying at that time was, the sun never sets on the British Empire. There was always some place that Great Britain owned where the sun was shining. Some place, that's how spread out and that, uh, that's how uh, prosperous that nation was. And this continued on for, um, for a, a hundred years or so. 
And on November the 2nd, England made a promise to the Jews. They made a promise to them that they would create a homeland for the Jews because in 1917, England conquered the Turks and they went in and they possessed the land of Palestine. As that was the first time in, I don't know how many centuries, that a European nation now possessed the land of Palestine. And England promised the Jews, they said, we will do our best to create a homeland here for you in the land of Palestine. The Jews had been offered land in Africa, they turned it down, they said, no, we have to go back to our native land. So on November the 2nd, 1917, this is what is known as the Balfour Declaration, His Majesty's gov government views with favor the establishment in Palestine, notice that, in Palestine, of a national home for the Jewish people, and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. Well, that really looks good on paper. The problem is, they reneged on their promise. You've heard of Lawrence of Arabia? Well, Lawrence of Arabia was, raised an army of Arabs to fight the Turks at that same period in history. And he was quite successful. And in the, in the uh, uh, fighting and so forth, he had promised the Turks that England would establish a homeland for Palestinians in Israel. But, today Israel, ancient Israel. And so England reneged on their promise to the Jews and they worked towards building a homeland for, uh, for Palestinian people, for Arab people. Now that was on November the 2nd of 1917. Between 1917 and 1948, when Israel became a nation, Great Britain lost her empire. She lost their, that vast empire, 25% of the Earth's surface. They lost it in those short period of time, in that short period of time. The sun never sat on the British Empire. Not true today. In Genesis 12:3, God had promised Abraham 3,900 years before, I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. When England mistreated the Jews and drove them out in 1290 AD on the ninth day of the month of Av, God withheld his blessing from them and they remained nothing but a little island nation. When England opened their doors to the Jews, God blessed them and increased their holdings to 25% to of the earth's surface. And when they broke their promise to the Jews, England lost their empire within just a few years, from 1917 to 1948. Well, interesting thing about that Balfour Declaration concerning Israel. The Balfour Declaration was drawn up in 1917. It was uh, November the 2nd. Now in the Bible, 30, the number 30, is symbolic of maturity. Uh, Jews were not allowed to go to war till they were 30 years of old uh, of age. Jesus did not begin his public ministry till he was 30. David did not become king till he was 30, and so forth. This 30 is the uh, number of that represents maturity. Well, you take 1917 and you add 30 years to that, and that brings you to 1947. And November the 29th, 1947, the United Nations partitioned Palestine to create the State of Israel. And six months later, May 14th, 1948, they officially became a nation. 30 years, they reached maturity. And by the same token in the Bible, the number 50 is an interesting number because that's the Jubilee year. In the Jubilee year, property all reverted back to the original owners. If you were gonna buy a house and it was closing in on the Jubilee year, don't buy it because in just a few years when the Jubilee year comes, you gotta give it back, it goes back to the original owner. 
Well, isn't that interesting? 1917, the Balfour Declaration is drawn up. 50 years later, brings you to 1967. What happened in 1967? The Six Day War. What happened in the, the Six Day War? Israel took back its land. The Golden Heights, the West Bank, and the city of Jerusalem itself. 50 years, the Jubilee. Well, at any rate, uh, let's go on to the next one. Here's the seventh day of calamity. Spain expels all the Jews in the year 1492. And they did it on the ninth day of the month of Av, 1492. 800,000 Jews were driven out of Spain. And God has his little jokes. <laughs> he sits, the Bible tells us in the second Psalm, he sits in the heaven and laughs at the puny efforts of man. The very same historical date, the month of Av, the ninth day of the month, when King Ferdinand is driving all the Jews out of Spain, Christopher Columbus is beginning his voyage where he thought to go to the West Indies. Only he never made it to the West Indies. Instead, he discovered America. And America has become a haven for Jews that were persecuted and driven out from all the nations of Europe as well as other countries, Arab countries and so forth. And we have more Jews in, in, our, uh, in America today than the nation of Israel over there in the Middle East does. We have more Jews than they do. Why? Because America became a haven. And so the very day that King Ferdinand drives all the Jews out of Spain, Columbus launches his voyage to discover America, which was to become a haven for the dispersed Jews from around the world. God has his little laughs in all of this. Not only that, but America was the first nation in 1948 to officially diplomatically recognize the state of Israel. And so America has, been a, has played a key role down through the years and, in, concerning the Jews. What's happened to Spain since they drove out the Jews? They had the Spanish Inquisition and all of that. What's happened to Spain? Well, they have degenerated down into a third-rate or fourth-rate power. Nobody worries about Spain. At that time, Spain was the most powerful nation on the face of the earth until they turned against the Jews. And again, Genesis 12, 3, I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. And that prophecy has played out. It has come to pass. Well, let's go to the eighth day of calamity. And this involves the nation of Russia. This is Russia under the czars. And they launched their persecution of the Jews in the year 1914. And they did it on August the 1st, 1914, which on the Jewish calendar is the month Av, the ninth date. This happened 422 years after Great Britain drove out the Jews. Now Russia is doing it. And they, call, they launched what they call the pogroms, where they came in, would come in and into the Jewish settlements, the Jewish ghettos, and they would just destroy everything. And then they'd pass laws that you got to sell all your property or we're going to confiscate it. And uh, they drove the Jews up. You ever saw the, the musical play, A Fiddler on the Roof? It's a story of how the Jews were persecuted under the czar in those days. And so they launched this crusade against the Jews. And they did it on the day of calamity, the month of Av, on the ninth day of the month. And they began killing Jews in eastern Russia and in Poland. Something, as it's estimated, at about 100,000 Jews were killed at that time. What happened to Russia? They persecuted and drove out the Jews. Within three years, the Tsar was overthrown by the Bolsheviks. And for the next 70 years, Russia suffered under communism. I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them 
that cursed thee. An amazing chain of events stretching across 35 centuries. The chances of all eight of these calamities befalling the people of Israel is 863 million times 1 billion. I don't know what that comes to. You can figure it out if you want to. But it all take, it is taking place 863 million times 1 billion. That's the law of probability for all eight of these things taking place. The day of calamity. Deuteronomy 32, 35, God said, To me belongeth the vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand. And that first day of calamity was at hand at that time. And in Obadiah, three times he says, Thou shalt not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shalt not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. A historical event, it happened eight times, stretching over 35 centuries, a day of calamity. Oh, by the way, not everything on that day is bad because Sue Haney's birthday is on that day. <laughs> <laughs> Sue, now let's see that. Sue, that's kind of a bad word though. It's a sue, sue somebody. So. <laughs> All right. Next week we'll continue on our detective work in the Word of God. Let's pray together. Loving Father, we thank you now for the Word of God. Lord, you are a great God. We know you are the God of history and you're the God of the future and you're the God of the present as well. And we thank you for being with us at this present hour. Just bless the study of your word, and Lord, we just pray that uh, we might be able to share it with others and see what a great book you've given us. Forgive us, Lord, for neglecting it as much as we do. Help us to read it, learn it, study it, mark it, memorize it, and share it with others. Dismiss us with your blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.